field activities on command. On command, they are emphasizing. Correct. correct. But, I, but I guess that eventually they will not be able to do even themselves also. What do you think, Madhu? No, no, it should be on command. Because even in the late stage, the automatic movements are preserved. For example, a person who is asked to put out the tongue, he may not put out the tongue, but after some time, spontaneously, he may put it out. So mm. then, yeah, then, then only we can call it apraxia. In the automatic so that, so yes. that on command is important? Oh, important. Very, very important. Even the late stage. Now, if it is on command, then what is the significance of apraxia? Clinical significance? Because uh, he'll be able to do anything. Uh, then, then where will it interfere in his day-to-day -day activity? See, because in the, uh, see, Madhu, yeah. in his in our day-to-day -day activity, we don't listen to come on. When we eat food, we eat ourselves. Yeah. Nobody tells us eat food. Yeah, so correct. then, how will it then how will it interfere in our day-to-day -day activity of a patient? That's that, my question. That is why in apraxia, in yeah. uh, what you said is correct. Um, uh, the spontaneous activities like soloing, speaking, etc., may, may not be affected. Yeah. Whatever action you do, motor action you do, can be affected on voluntary command. That is what the definition is. So these yeah. people in the end stages, as you said correctly, they will not be able to solo, drink food, everything there. Or facial apraxia that is a little different from what is a motor apraxia we are talking about. Yeah. 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 Yes. yeah. Okay. So anyway, I think we'll have a good discussion and uh, I will request you to answer questions. <laughs> All that because you sure. are here for support. Sure, sure. Sure. That was a great yeah. doubt, Subhash Kaul, sir. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay, Madhu, I think are we? I mean, we'll how many parts? Oh, 38 are already there. So we can start, boss. Okay, okay. So good morning to all of you. This is the 40th session of the challenging case series. Unfortunately, I could not get very interesting challenging case this week. But anyway, I'll show some, not even though that not very interesting, some good things. Is it visible to you? Yeah, yeah, yes. it's visible. Okay, okay. So we'll start with the short case first. The story of a 34-year-old man is still walking difficulty in the form of dragging of the sorry, I think that's not the first case, sorry. This is the first case. The 47 old lady has ended with history of gradually progressive mental decline and slowness in walking for the last two years. Past history of acute onset of left lower limb weakness six months back, which improved in two weeks' time. Not a diabetic or hypertensive, was being treated by a psychiatrist for depression. This is a story. Gradually progressive mental decline and slowness for two years. Acute onset of weakness six months back, which improved two weeks time, two weeks' time. So an examination at this point of time, high mental functions was grossly normal, cranial nerves normal, motor system normal, motor system, motor power tone normal, but there was generalized slowing of activity. No weakness, data were brisk bilaterally. However, pandas were flexor, sensations normal. So what do you want now? MRI. Okay, MRI. This is the MRI of the patient. I'll go slowly one by one. Looks like a And let us see the people film. This is the second cut. Uppermost cut. This is the third one. So what is the diagnosis? Cadacil. sir. So you're all, all much, much better, eh? Okay. <laughs> I think you need not attend this uh, teaching program. <laughs> okay. No, so, sir. No, sir. <laughs> so, echo, alter, lipid profile, VDR negative, ANA profile, APLA normal. So, what do you want? Gene test was done, which shows the, the notch 3 gene was sequenced, which is positive. So, it confirms the diagnosis of cadacin. So, it's not a great case, but still, it is a good case, not the common case. Madhu, so, did you have a family history? No family history, of course. There's no family history. I subsequently asked for the family so there was no family history. Okay. So the Sir, group, what are the association of this uh, my migraine and uh, 
Yeah. There was, they can have migraine, they can have psychiatric disturbances. I think Subhash could be able to tell better than me. I, whatever yeah. I know that the, the symptomatology, onset of symptomatology differ in the age group. Initially, they start with migraine, then they started having stroke-like symptoms, then they go into dementia. That is the sequence uh, which I have learned. You chart with 20 years, then comes the stroke 40 years, then comes the dementia later. So what's called so, cancer? Yeah, yeah, right. So what, what was his main core symptom, sir? His main symptom was uh, progressive decline in mental decline for two years. That is a complaint he came with. But in okay. fact, the patient had had infarct earlier. As shown yeah. by the MRI, multiple yeah. acutes can be seen. Yeah, and uh, no gait disturbances or anything like that. And there is a slowness of activity. Yeah. Yeah. That's why yeah. the psychiatrist thought that the patient's having depression and was put on antidepressant drugs. Yeah. yeah. No, you know, you may have all of these features or you may not have all of these features. You exactly. may only have isolated things, you know. Yeah. That depends upon the evolution of the disease. Okay. That's all right. Yeah, sure. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. So I think you MRI, was the, MRI was the main the, uh, Yeah, the, clue. the clue was that uh, hmm. temporal pole hypertensity in this patient. Yes. Yes, yes. The affection of external yes. care in the Yes, sir. Dementia in young. Yeah, correct. Right. Okay, sir. Okay, then I'll go to the next case. Yes. This is a story of a 34-year-old man. He's still walking difficulty in the form of dragging of left foot mm. and loosening of the upper mm. uh, Again, left foot for the last one year. Can you people please mute till I finish my presentation? Then you can unmute, please. He's still walking difficulty in the form of dragging on the left foot and loosening of the chappers on the left foot for the last one year. Clumsiness of the left hand for the last six months, seven months. Inable to hold heavy objects with the left hand for the last three months. History of episodes of tinnitus in the right ear followed by facial elevation to the left side, uprolling of the eyes and abducting posturing of the left upper limb, lasting for two to three minutes for the last one year. I'll show that particular video, I not the video, the description of that by, by video. These episodes used to occur three to four times per month. The last attack was six months back. It's the story of a 34-year-old man. Presently has come with walking difficulty in the form of tracking on the left foot, from the last one year. He gave history of clumsiness to the left hand for the last six, seven months and enabled to hold objects with the left hand for three months. In addition, he gave another, another complaint that episodes of tinnitus in the right ear followed by facial deviation to the left side, uprolling of the eyes and abducted position of the left upper limb lasting for two to three minutes for the last one year. These episodes used to occur three to four times a month the last attack was six months back. Now, this is the description of the attack which was telling him. Uh, this is where he's showing. He's aware. This is the way the hand goes. Okay, this is the. I think you can understand. The, I mean, I mean, uh, what he, even though you could understand the language, you can understand what he was trying to express. Now they go to the examination. He had keys evoked nystagmus. I will show you a little close up. I'll show you. Ocular moments were normal. People were normal. See the case nystagmus, you can make it out. I'll show the close up view. Okay. Can you make out the nystagmus? Yeah. He had case of nystagmus. Yes, sir. It's only present in horizontal direction, between the right now. The rest of the cleanliness are all normal. Moments are all... uh, he had put some pose in his that he says his presence from childhood. 
adequate spasticity of both upper limbs. Over the power was normal. There is no definite incoordination I could make out. Slow limb spasticity was there. But left loose flexion was weak, so all the evasion on the right side is normal. HL was weak on the left side. And the flexion was normal. Keep up protection normal. Extension normal. Into the reflexes, biceps is open at L separable normally. Over triceps and twinkle pressure were absent. I let it. Your pressure is also absent. I need to I need Knee and angle is equipped with square that. Angle is equipped with normal, not just. Randos are going by that. Sensations are all normal. Vibration normal. Heat is less, but not very convincing. Still, part is it normally. Just a normal in both up and low. Said initially few mistakes, but it not very convincing. That's it, correct. It was finding difficult to get up from bed. I 
sorry, I did not hear you said the video. Rhombus was negative and it walked with a wide based and stiff gait. Get up from sitting position. These are the findings. So, on examination, high mental functions are normal. Cranial nerves had ease of nystagmus, other cranial functions were normal. Spasticity of both upper and lower limbs. Weakness of left wrist plexus and inverters. Other muscles normal. <coughs> Deep reflexes, biceps supinator normal, decreased triceps and finger pressure bilaterally. Knee jerk by brisk, angle jerk but normal or brisk, which you can be. Pandar upgoing bilaterally, sensation is normal. And gait, wide based, spastic gait. Romberg's negative. So, where is the localization? <clears throat> it's got cerebellar involvement. Yeah, correct. And he's got a cervical uh, myelopathy also, maybe because the tricep jerk and finger flexion are absent Absolutely. in spite of. Uh, and those uh, movements we are describing could be tonic spasms. Uh, it could be tonic spasms, but it's affecting the face also. If it is due to tonic spasms, due to cervical cord lesion, we don't expect a um, face deviation. No, no, because the brainstem involvement is having. Yeah, yeah, okay. and, Okay, brain stem involvement producing chronic spasm. Yeah, that can produce that. I agree, I agree. Not with the cervical cord. Right. Sir, uh, but here, uh, one point is that he had tinnitus proceeding to the onset of the spasms. But yeah, it could region. be a right uh, inferior collicular uh, level uh, lesion involved in the midbrain also. But the so called tonic spasm, you won't uh, go to the brain stem, you won't get the sensory symptomatology. Because of a fabric or the same, okay. it can be a fissure then because you got uh, interest on the right side, all the way fissure deviation on the left side, and left it's side. It's yeah, it's yeah, facial brachial dystonic seizure, sir. Yeah, that's a possibility. Facial brachial again, the problem is the tinnitus, sir. Uh, so, sir, facial brachial dystonic seizure will not have a, a tinnitus like it. No, no, they, don't, they, don't, they won't have. Okay. It's really basal ganglia origin. Those with uh, facial brachial dystonic lesions, the, the MRI findings showed it's the ganglia hyperdensity in T1 sequences. The origin is in the basal ganglia. And facial brachial dystonic seizures won't be this prolonged, no? It will be just a yeah, second. Yeah, it, it may be this much prolonged, maybe. but he says sometimes it may be one or two, that's according to the description. But the possibility we can't totally rule out because sometimes some of them can keep wrong as well. Sir, a tinnitus followed by seizure can be temporal of origin, sir, like lateral yeah, temporal lobe. That, that's what I thought it's a temporal of seizure. Because the thing always precipitates tinnitus and getting these episodes. The tinnitus on the right side and left side is getting this kind of phenomena. That's so what I thought was likely in this patient. So, yeah, sir, but what uh, did you yeah, tell me? Yeah? Uh, sir, uh, sir, I think he must have a multiple sites because this uh, cervical cord is affected. Is cerebellar structures, uh, possibly the brainstem. Since mm -hmm. he has got a loss, uh, ref ref, uh, I mean, ref reflexes, there could be an additional uh, syrinx in this. I mean, something like a multiple anomalies in the spinal cord, the brainstem, as well as in the cord cortex. Because uh, that can explain this, uh, this issues, the cerebellar, as well as the uh, spinal cord, bilateral spinal cord. Okay. 
right so problem cortex also is getting affected yes sir yeah so what could be the possibility we'll keep in mind in this case some very ventricular case. some uh, i mean uh, perinatal insult on the, some glyc gly, uh, some glyc gly, gly, so but his symptomatology started only for the last uh, one year vasculitis okay vasculitis is a possibility okay uh, it is difficult to come to an etiology with that only we can localize the localization is not in the brain stem flocculus because even though he had case of nystagmus he had no cerebellar ataxia no incontinence the finger be moment no get attacks he only gaze of nystagmus was there you know white based attacks again no sir white yeah. based ah right, right. there is a white based attack so white based may be due to the immune but he had he could walk without any incontinence to any attacks at either side he was walking white based so the lobar vermin can produce pardon lobar not the lobar or vermin alone can produce the Yeah, this based. White, base, uh, white base can be due to many reasons. One of them is cerebellar, but usually they have associated incontinence with the limbs as well. But here it is not there, and there is no much of a gait attack. He is walking with a stiff gait, but the limbs are uh, legs are wide. So cerebellar cortex. This is what I thought. Cerebral cortex, right? So it is the auditory cortex. By primal sense, spasticity, cori cervical cord. And what is causing the left weakness? The left foot. Yes, weakness only of the dose of blood cells and the vertebrae. What are the muscles? Hmm? What are the That's pyramidal tracts? Pyramidal tracts. Yeah, it could be because that angle <laughs> checks as well preserve, but that can occur with the uh, suppose why can be corn pyramidal nerve as well, unrelated corn pyramidal nerve. Possible. It can also be ruled out. And yeah, no, no total sensory is not there in this patient. the sensation is normal and the yeah normal because even if you are making confusing in the the lower limb is making some mistake it initially it said it decreases sometimes it said it is normal so anyway keep that possibility also in our mind sir one doubt sir yeah so in this left common peroneal uh, uh, no sir in the pyramidal usually we have the dorsal flexors and the everters weakness will it produce its selective ehl weakness also yeah yeah of course of course they can come with isolated ehl weakness Pyramidal tract lesion can produce isolated ehl weakness because the, the ehl is the first muscle to go in the dorsal flexion. So, is it possible to have a, an another lesion in the dorsal cord, the low, lower dorsal cord, to explain the uh, left uh, foot weakness? No, but that we, we need not necessarily because we already got in something like a decreased reflex in the upper limb. So that may be the thing we have to keep localization slightly there. Asymmetric involvement can explain the pyramidal weakness on the left side, but the right plantar is also upgrowing. So maybe okay, that possibility you have to keep in mind. But we not necessarily posit as a separate thoracic cord just to explain the weakness. So putting it uh, everything, uh, could that be some uh, uh, cranial vertebral junction anomaly with uh, multiple lesions? But the C, the seizure part is there. Yeah, I mean some uh, heterotopia as well. Which okay, will, let's you know. okay, difficult. Yeah. So let us see that. I will show the images. I will not tell what the diagnosis are. Then you, go, you then by that time you will make the diagnosis by yourself. There are one doubt, sir. Yeah. Sir, sometimes this hydrocephalus nose, sir, with producing the irritable with the irritated sir cerebral fossa can produce the stenosis and the. You know, that's it's uncommon producing like uh, this kind of a phenomena uh, seizure phenomena has been described in hydrocephalus but very rare that to uh, temporal lobe epilepsy origin is what is described needle temporal okay the directives of the temporal horns okay i'll go over the investigations one by one this is the t2 weighted sequence cervical cord shows mild hypertension in the cord this is the brain stem i will show all the sequence then you can come to the thing this is a coronal cut now this is the i zoomed up that particular picture here i will find out sorry this one this is for you This is the medulla level. 
This is the T1 weighted sequence. This is the flare. There is frontal subcortical hyperdensity can be seen. And this is cervical cord and the brain stem. Any thoughts? Looks like a third pole. HSP plus syndrome, sir. Okay. Alexander's disease. Yeah, third ball. Very good. Third. This is Alexander's disease. See, the clue is that, see, the brainstem is severely at the bone, medulla is severely atrophied, and the cervical cord as well. Go back and let us see this picture once. And he has got another clue. He has got a frontal hyperdensity, subcortical hyperdensity. In Alexander's disease, you get this is the first area affected is the frontal lobe. Now, in, in adult tons, they can present only with brainstem symptomatology. I'll show the video once again. See, look at the medulla. It is so much atrophied here. Then you see again, 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 you can make out the atrophy of the metal lab with hypo, hyper, hypo intensity within the inferior subadular epidemic. See the atrophy of the brainstem and the cervical cord is also atrophied. Again, you make out the hypo intensity in the metal lab deteriorated. So, this is adult onset Alexander's disease. But how can you get food drop in Alexander's disease? You can have a pyramidal, I mean, the, in a, it is asymmetrical foot drop confined in the left lower lip below knees. You difficult to explain with the metal relation like the cervical cord. Or unless you think that asymmetrically affected more on one side, confining on the left side. Any other investigation like to do? The lower down the cord. That's normal. Oh. Sir, uh, isn't there no. uh, some syrinx or something in the cervical cord, some hyperintensity there? Yeah, there is. There could be syrinx, but uh, the hyperintensity is there. But, you know, in, in Alexander, this is hyperintensity, you know, necessarily means syrinx. See, it can occur in the, in the, in the medulla also, in the, in the, also there. See, this hyperintensity can be seen within the, the, the parenchyma itself. It could be, nobody can say it cannot be syrinx. It can, radiologically, it can mimic syrinx. But now everything is hyperindense. The upper part cervical cord here, it's all hyperindense. Any other investigation you would like to do? Nerve conduction. Nerve conduction. Yeah. Nerve conduction shows decreased CMAP amplitude in the peroneal now. But that's not important. We are important for. Also, we like to know whether the sensory is affected or not. The sensory is also affected. <laughs> that tells you it's clearly a lesion outside the CMS. It is not in the spinal cord in affects in any way. It has to be at the peripheral nerve. So it's an unrelated horn peroneal palsy, probably because of the pressure palsy or something because the awkward way of it's walking. So this is other no, than upper limb nerve connection. Upper limb condition is normal. Every other condition is normal except for the condition. Even in the lower limb, all other things are normal. The upper limb condition also see here is normal. So uh, was there a fit uh, that he had that facial brachial dystonic uh, features? Similar? No, they are seizure, seizure phenomena due to frontal lobe or temporal lobe involvement. See, these people can have multi-axial, multi-system involvement, multi-axial involvement. Because Alexander is classically the requirement, the hemispheres are affected. But the adult onset usually present with the lower medullary or brain stem involvement. Uh, so, what is the cause of the absent uh, triceps and uh, then difficult, then, then difficult to explain. Probably the lesion is extending down to the cervical cord as well. As you can see here, see the lesion is coming down, the atrophy is coming down. Probably the, that affection of the antidepressants may be affected at that level itself. Then maybe there's maybe the explanation for decreased uh, reflex. Why it is sparing the biceps and supinator and affecting the triceps and finger press difficult to explain. So, so the frontal horn, that is a sign that is a uh, I mean that uh, 
in in uh, hsp plus also you get similar yeah, that, uh, that's different that's year of link sign that yeah. is in hsp 12 or 17 why you forgot the number 11 11 that's entirely different that appearance is entirely different that's a linear thing going to the frontal node anteriorly uh, but here it is a diffuse white matter ethnicity not like a year of links no this is not like that it goes tight like that. This is a, a, a widely a broad based hypertensity. The other one is pointed, sir. It's, point, like yeah, it's, it's pointed upward, correct. Okay, so that's the case of Alessandrian disease. Sir, how to explain uh, absent triceps lipases? Yeah, that's what you, uh, Umar was also asking about. Difficult to explain. The only thing is that the cord involvement has been extended down to the cervical cord as well. That is the only way to explain that thing. Okay. So it's a rare leukodystrophy which typically presents with progressive spasticity, weakness, bulbar dysfunction, and other pain cell features. Often there is also autonomic involvement. There are three clinical subtypes based on the age of onset. Infinite form is the fetal within few years, whereas the juvenile adult forms can have, where they are present similarly, can have more protracted course. Sometime back in our CAN meeting from the Calicut, the person presented only with the dementia. I don't know whether you remember it's not. And an adult person present dementia, he had Alexander disease. MRI pitch showed only bilateral frontal hyperintensity. This is again the same. This is in the literature showing the appearance just like our patient. Okay, any questions? I will go to the next one. What did you give, sir? Pardon? Treatment, what did you give? Antispasic therapy. Agent, sir? What, what did you give us treatment? No, no, we did not give anything. Nothing can be given for the patient, no treatment. The seizures also. Of uh, course, seizures we give and antispastic drugs like Leofen we were giving. So the mutation study is done for this patient, sir? No, 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 because he couldn't afford any of these things. Now, once we end, we are fairly certain about the diagnosis. Clinical presentation is a certain a typical finding. Has got cerebellar involvement plus medullary involvement. Radiating picture was convincing. MRA, the, 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 when you see the upper part of the brain also, it's also very much typical. So I don't think with the test can be done to confirm it. But you know, it involves money. We have to spend from patients to spend from his pocket for a non treatable disease. Any family history in this, sir? Family there, there is no family history in this patient. The other patient from Caligat also did not have any family history. Okay. Because it's autosomal recessive, you know, that means you may not get a family history. So that left upper limb clumpsness could be due to pyramidal. It could not. Left patient had. The patient had left upper limb clumsiness, no, sir? Clumsiness. Yeah, that's what the pyramid in one. Yeah, could be it. So, we'll go to the next case. This 35 year old man had a clavicular fracture, and she was he was put on a steel plate under local anesthesia by the orthopedist. Following the surgery, immediately following the surgery, he noticed inability to lift up his left upper limb. He had no weakness prior to anesthesia. And he has no sensory complaint as well. No pain, no sensory complaint, but he said he cannot lift up his left upper limb. So this is his video. The orthopedician got frightened and sent the patient to me because he's being alleged that everything to following is local injection or the surgery. Right upper limb was all normal. The findings were confirmed in the left upper limb. The altitude is about gate 4 power. See, the power is of relatively good power. 4 to 4 plus. But look at the biceps on the left side. He could not hold it. He cannot even lift it again. It's cavity. It goes into pronation. When he keeps it flat, it goes into pronation. 
he cannot dictate against uh, gravity. The brake rail is also weak. The adductors of the shoulder is also weak. It goes into abduction. When he keep it adducted, he automatically goes outward. Goes outward like that. Then third object again was weak. It goes out like that. Biceps was weak, but not as weak as the biceps and supinator. It is weak, but test three. Finger forces are more weak on the left side. Finger axis is mean. You cannot lift up against cavity. Finger forces is normal on the right side. It is weak, but not as weak as the finger axis. Protection was severely weak. It is a policy severely weak in one only. It's like finger stitches. Protection was weak, but not as weak as the It is a policy strong. Intro shaver is also weak, but not as weak as the fingers. Reflexes, all biceps, supinated triceps absent on the left side. The early preference are all normal, they are not bending. Sensation, touch is able to feel normally. Pain also is feeling similar, same on both sides. It feels it more on the left side. Either, 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 and however, vibration is similar to the left side. If you need to keep vibration the little finger, it is decreased on the left side. He said he's not able to build the GPS. So these are the findings. So I'll summarize the findings. Findings were confirmed in the left upper limb. Left retroid about grade to four, four to four plus power. Left bicep supinator shoulder adductors grade one to two. We cannot even hold against cavity. Left radialis is a little more powerful, two to three. Triceps grade three. Left wrist finger extensors, not EHL, extensor policy is long as per grade one to two. Finger flexes, small muscles, left hand, three plus to four. DT are all absent in the left upper limb, normal in the other limbs. Sensory touch and pain normal, embed vibration JPS in the left hand, both um, thumb as well as little finger up to the that up to the wrist is in pain. So where is the localization? If you want the findings once again, I will want the video once again. I can show. So pan flexopathy. Okay, 
why not uh, yeah yeah break it yeah and uh, predominantly with, your, your voice is breaking with the can you sir it's a, a band break it but predominant involvement in the upper trunk upper break it but delta is normal that can be patchy involvement okay why not then see if this is a radiculopathy but how can all muscles are weak no other muscles also are weak yeah we can find uh, c5 to d1 root a uh, root you are telling okay uh, root that's no horners no no horners so this can be from a c5 to t1 uh, root or uh, uh, pan brachial uh, flexopathy due to yeah. a compression yeah correct that's also i keep in mind because i localization by base how to differentiate between the two now the root c5 uh, if you really don't then del without deltoid involvement how can we then then if it is applied if upper trunk did not the biceps also we expect upper trunk to be not be deltoid to be not brachial there can be patchy yeah <laughs> okay but radicals uh, once that root is gone means all that muscle supplied by the root should be involved yeah 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 what is correct correct unless it's a partial radiculopathy what is, but that second not a absolute point what other things you like to do your point is well taken patch yeah, nerve condition because patch involvement is more likely to occur with the brachial plexus than radiculopathy is correct but if you see the root avulsion part it's a, it, it may if you get a root avulsion like condition you may not get a complete in more you know, total involvement because it's a rootlet cell which is getting out affected so in one root is formed by one just not coming like a nerve multiple rootlets form the root when the rootlet is severed some of the muscles can be more affected than that in root avulsion not i am not talking about other conditions but it's in that but your point is well taken patch involvement as we discussed many times before is more common in Plexopathy rather than in true radiculopathy. But other thing, what will be the sensory? Sensory is all the most normal except this uh, uh, vibration joint cushion sense. Yeah, that correct. Everything is involved. So if if there is a radical, then no, then how can the, all the dermatomes be showing the normal touch? No, that is same applicable for both. In fact, the motor sensory dissociation is more common in radiculopathy than with plexopathies. You go to the injury plexopathies because the roots, motor roots, and sensory roots are separate. But since it's because they are joined together. Where the anesthesia was given, sir? I am I, because that is your question is very valid. They did a clavicular uh, plating. I just don't know. Under local anesthesia only given. I do not know where exactly they did the injection. Okay, what are the clinical examination? Will die. My question is all. You are all right, but I want to be more sure as to whether it's not in the root of the plexus. Autonomic functions would it help? Yeah, it would help, but more more simple bedside test. And the harness, sir. Look, look for the harness. Harness is like, not there. Not there. Then secondly, look the for flexes. the rhomboids. The ro yeah, rhomboids yeah, is the right. Function. Exactly, that's the thing I wanted you to tell. We for the, this is what you have to look. See, this is what I have done. His right is it's such a severe weakness of the whole muscle, the upper limb. Right as nothing is normal. Right as anterior is normal power. That tells you that it is not in the root at all. Hold it, sir. Like, you need to do it. Do it. Delta I am checking again. That is, you need to do it. You have to do it. That is, you must keep it up. Say that. Additional rotators are weak. Okay, let me carry it, sir. Like. What about rhomboids? Rhomboids, I was trying to check, but it could not. It is also it is also weak. But you can't comment on that because when the the fixators are weak, the testing of rhomboids become difficult, be problematic. Yeah, there is winging of scapula, no? On the involved side. And I'll tell, I'll tell. This is not the see. This is what I have done. I'm checking for the status and area. Okay. There is no winging due to any muscles because if it is it trapezes the upper part of the scapula should not gone out. If it is serrated sandira, the lower angle should wing and should be winging. It will be more prominent when the, I push the trunk forward. 
The problem in checking rhomboids is that you have to keep the uh, arm in that position. You cannot keep the arm in that position because of the severe weakness. The hand is going out to body. It's not stabilized. You, you understood what I said? And it's not stabilized means you have to put again it's the shoulder. When the shoulder extends are so weak, you cannot check the rhomboids muscle power because there is no leverage. Otherwise, you have to put uh, only hold the scapula and, and ask him to retract. That's you won't get any. You can't check a muscle power like that because scapula is a flat muscle. I, I, I mean, um, I don't know whether you're understanding what I said because we are checking rhomboids. We are keeping the putting keeping the ham in the abducted position and putting pressure onto the back of the arm. Okay, his arm acts as a lever. So when the shoulder fixate is a weak, or extensions is a weak, you cannot keep the arm in that position. So you can't check the movement of the scapula. They are indirectly checking the movement of the scapula, presuming the fixate should be normal. So that is where rhomboid stiffening become problematic in this way. I was trying to do that, but it appeared weak because of the fixators are weak. Okay, now, but the fact is that he has got normal serratus anterior which you can support your arm with your hand and then ask him to push, you can pick out the serratus weakness. And, uh, did you, uh, I don't know, uh, have you understood what I said? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, okay. So now we know it is likely to be, but the other point what Bindu said, right? See, um, the, um, uh, the deltoid is preserved and the patchy involvement is more common with the blood surgery. So this is NCV done after 12 days. Look at the NCV and delta panting. The magnitude left in median is normal, 9.4. Eps point not illicitable. Axilla illicitable. Radial is so severely weak there, but the amplitude is 5. Just 0 to 1 power. Musculocutaneous inelicitable. Axillary by 5.1. But compared to the axillary on the right side, this is axillary on the left side. The right side axillary also, it was 16.7. Uh, so even the axillary nerve is also affected a little bit. But not as severe as other, other things. FAV latency is normal. Sensation is normal. Snap is normal. Even in the arm, the where you picked up from the median and the ulnar all the snap is not. So, what is the interpretation of 10 CV? Is it the root because he has got sensory potential? Yes, sir. Is it the root? Or you see, after two weeks, this is after still be in the plexus. Sir. It could still be in the in the plexus. Ah, it is done after two weeks. After twelve days. Why but there is a but there is a condition block at the axilla. Okay, that what is agreed. Axilla and the Eps points. So most likely there is a condition block there rather than a. Yeah, right. Perfectly right. Where the snaps are absent then? Because uh, the uh, snaps may be a proximal conduction block. Yeah, exactly. That's the correct answer. See, it's just a conduction block. The fact that there is gross disparity in the CMAP amplitude from axillary and bicep. Bicep is not illicitable. So this lesion is likely to be in the plexus and not in the roots. That's point number as, as confirming what Bindu was telling. Now, why snaps are spread? You must always remember that the conduction distal to the block is normal. Okay? You get a normal CMAP amplitude or normal snap amplitude. So here what we are doing is that when the conduction block is partial, that is why you get a normal amplitude in the see, it's severely affected muscle, like radial. 5 millivolt because it is you do you think 5 millivolt have a zero power no that means there's a conduction block proximal to that 
okay as kimura has said when you get a normal cmm amplitude and there is weakness that means there is conduction block it is either proximal to any or proximal to that particular area of stimulation so it's got a conduction block proximally the amplitude by some day there is a little less compared to the other side because some axons are also got affected and is clearly you can make out the conduction black block at the f in the proximal to the axilla axilla is normal the proximal to the axilla is uh, is affected so why the stamps are affected because you are stimulating distal to that all your sensory conduction you are doing where you are stimulating at the elbow stimulating in the wrist stimulating in the axilla that's all you are not picking up from the sensory conduction from the ventral plexus it will take time for the sensory to get uh, involved yeah. also now after the yeah. uh, but that takes at least by 11 days maximum 11 days snap should be absent if there is an axon involved that is why the conduction on the 12th day then only we can give significance for the absent or presence of snap if the snap is preserved be, be, before it is done by i mean before it is done uh, 10 days ahead uh, before 10 days then uh, it does not carry any significance you may purely spuriously diagnose a root lesion the stamp may be preserved but after 11 days if stamp is preserved that it's a root lesion in the area of sensory loss here's a total loss of jps and vibration of the hand so the key we are simply because that is because the sensory nerves have a conduction block proximal to the axilla so we know now the lesion is in the brachial plexus proximal to the axilla axilla distal to the root okay so what could be the etiology in this patient neuropax demyelination demyelination from my side yeah it's demyelination why is the demyelination occurring due to that uh, this thing can occur sir it's traumatic or some but not to trauma cannot put this whole plexus involvement is cannot explain by trauma what's the latest ah local anesthetic agent see it's well known this baby cane can produce focal demyelination like some day back a presented a prolonged cesarean section when they give local anesthesia the patient can have develop involvement of the epicondus corners region producing uh, unilateral paralysis of the lower limb with sensory loss then you can even hypernate set in the corners some of them may have seen such cases when called for a weakness in the following cesarean section so that is because the reaction to the baby king which, which is the agent uh, uh, given for the local anesthesia so probably it is due to the local affection of the nerve due to the baby king producing demyelination and conduction block so uh, recently i have seen a case uh, it's a, a exactly similar case after yeah. epidur i mean uh, for the lcs correct, correct. Are, and then there, there's a lesion also in the lower uh, corner the epicondus corner uh, exactly yeah, exactly that's exactly said you must have seen such cases there are some three four cases like that in fact for the ian or ian i presented such one of the such cases so what is the prognosis of such cases prognosis If most of them they improve very well very well after some time it will take some time they improve very well all the cases which i have seen they improved so is it because the bupivacaine or some embolization no no it's not the embolization it the you know that if you in your case also if you look carefully the lesion the weakness may be confined to one lower limb correct it is one lower limb only left on one side so you may argue why not both lower limb if it should the corners be my lesion if the corners involvement this what i have mostly at that time was that see the lp was done in the lateral recommended position yes sir okay so the the drug which are administering is dependent so that limb is affected i found out that subsequently i all went and inquired in which position the patient was lying for for the lp always in the dependent position the limb which is down is get affected by the following cesarean section and all the cases which i have seen all following cesarean section yes, i don't know why because because probably they are giving this is for anesthesia they are giving for local anesthesia for the cesarean section they remain in that position for long and then get this uh, they drug for this team and in following cesarean they find they cannot move one lower 
this patient had a classical uh, sen sensory loss compared to left lower limb, uh, ref reflex loss, extensor that, gland, uh, mild weakness. That's a typical presentation. It's exactly the same presentation which I also seen also. So what I'm postulating is that, so the, the local anesthetic can produce such problem. And this is one of such, uh, th this I'm postulating only. I've not seen such case before. Long anesthetic has produced some kind of a conduction block at that area. So how you, what will you do in this patient? So a doubt, sir. Yeah. Sir, if it to be chemical related, then why sensory is not much involved? No, that is quite very, sensory is affected. Because he, being a demyelination, it picks up the large fibers. They, that is why the pain and temperature is preserved. However, the posterior column and JPS vibration JPS is affected. In demyelination, as you know, large fibers are affected first because they are thickly myelinated fibers. Pain fibers are unmyelinated fibers. That is when G, in classical JPS and all, the pain is much less affected than the vibration posterior. So could it be idiopathic brachial neuritis unrelated? Yeah, it could be. It could be can person like that. Nothing again is that possibility. But they said temporal correlation, that is it followed immediately. If you had thought of something sometime later, I would have considered it a possibility. But immediately after that surgery injection, he surgery you know, is a weakness. And this is not the usual type of flexopathy which you see, uh, neurologic emetic we see. So what will you do? And the usual neurologic emetrophy is an axonopathy, not demyelinating type. Most of them, the context will be normal initially in uh, in, 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 uh, in neurologic emetrophy because it's confined only to one upper trunk or lower trunk like that. And give steroids. Yes, so I want, that's what I give. I give IVAB for five days. And just after one week, you can see this patient's power is improved. Biceps has improved. Initially, you cannot record again in cavity. Biceps has improved also. The finger extension did not improve very much. Wrist extension is good. You are smiling when you're. Yeah. <laughs> The finger plays are all beginning. The process continued to remain absent. And after one month, it's totally weakness, totally. No one thing has come back. This is after one week. Okay, so that's the second case. Any uh, sir, uh, sir, yeah. I have a question, sir. Please, please. Uh, sir, I I had a similar. I have one patient after the LP for cesarean section, sir. Yes, yeah. uh, uh, actually, we also thought of giving a, uh, this one IVMP, uh, but. Uh, I read, then we discussed with the gynecologist what I heard is uh, uh, that uh, cesarean section that suture that uh, scar healing, mm. uh, complete healing requires almost three months. Mm. But uh, oh, some uh, moderate healing can happen after about uh, three weeks to four weeks. Mm. That's what uh, I heard, sir. Then in fact, relative itself, they wanted whether to give steroid or not. They also read some article like that. Uh, then what is your opinion, sir, whether you, you should give steroid? Absolutely, we should give steroid. So what uh, we are giving steroid only uh, for even after surgery for muscle biopsy and all immediately okay. after muscle biopsy we give steroid for polymyositis. Okay. So because matter. okay, sir. Yeah, yeah, Since sir. it was after their first delivery, sir, uh, that was first baby that baby that lady had. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought it can be uh, if he wound healing is not uh, so strong, uh, it will be problematic for our next uh, delivery. Okay. Uh, we also thought uh, anyway, these uh, conduction blocks will improve after uh, it may some more time for a uh, complete recovery. That's what we thought and not given. Just okay. uh, uh, wanted your opinion, sir. No, in the, all the cases which I've followed, which I've seen, I give steroid straight away. After, okay. Because now it becomes root. I know that the moment the pay, I call to see such a page, I know this is the problem. Okay, so sir. I give steroid away. No, none of them had any problem. Sir, I've got a question. Yeah, please. Yeah. 
sir we all must have seen lots of patients who are given uh, inadvertent injection in the uh, gluteal region and they get sciatic now injury okay. because of chemical necrosis yeah. and somehow they don't improve with steroids how did right. this patient improve so so yeah. perfectly right because that is because what happened means there it is not a secondary edema it is direct toxic effect on the nerve the injection is given to the nerve and the material which is giving you may be different so they here they are giving a local anesthetic agent like baby cane that is what is a secondary demyelination that how the demyelinates but is not direct toxic effect to the drug it is causing a secondary effect causing the demyelination uh, because the injection is not directly into the cord it is the drug which is causing a secondary effect on spinal cord there it is in, the drug is specifically into the nerve into the sciatic nerve there is a toxic necrosis in the nerve and usually the drug which is given for this analgesic agent or some antibiotic which is given that is causing the problem the mechanism of damage is different this is a demyelinate conduction block secondary to that not to the toxic damage to the nerve that is why they are improving as you said correctly though whatever sciatic nerve palsy do they don't improve Uh, very much. They only partially improve mainly. Yes, sir. This after IV painter person may be give short course steroid also, sir. Yeah, I usually give short course steroid, but luckily for him, he improved remarkably. Any any questions? So, so the, the same question, uh, you know, I, I would like to ask. because uh, you know we get a lot of uh, nerve biopsy muscle biopsy so whether to give steroids or not whether it would uh, affect the wound healing so i think it's so uh, we have to give straight away steroid isn't it sir yeah yeah, yeah. Huh? i uh, know sir uh, I, sir my query was that uterine scar sir the skin scar that is okay that will get healed but uh, the uterine scar sir where the muscle that uh, they have separated the muscle there oh that part i don't know I don't know specifically in Caesar. I don't know, uh, but only about the, the other conditions which we are stating. We give. For example, craniotomy. No, we routinely give alto craniotomy. We see that example. That's not every patient we are giving for a craniotomy with mass lesions. Everything. Okay, sir. Okay. Shall we go to the next case? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. This 34-year-old lady has presented the history of episodic severe crampy pain on the left face, associated with jerky movements of the left ear, and sometimes facial deviation on the left, and narrowing the peripheral vision to the left side. Now, here the the history is very very important with this patient. So I can hear the Malayalam, and I will convert it to if you are not understood into English. So the episodes were associated with clenching of the jaw. With the tongue getting caught in between the jaw for the last one day, the clenching of the jaw results in injury to the tongue on both sides of the tongue. So the elder once again, she get episodic severe crampy pain on the left face, the left mastoid area, with jerky movements of the left ear. Again, I, that video will show. Sometimes with facial deviation to that side, and and palpable pressure narrowing. This is associated with the jaw getting clenched, so that the tongue get caught in between the jaw, producing injury. Now this is the history. This is the movement she was referring to. The movements of the ear for backward and forward. We can make out that. This is when she is getting the pain now. She is getting pain of the jaw. अदायद 
This is story. I think uh, those who have not understood Malayalam, I think you can, from the expression, you can make out what she is trying to convey. The jaw clenches, even if it one side contracts, both sides jaw will get clenched. Then the pain is always on the left side. Sometimes it's facial deviation on the left side with eye closure and ear getting moved up um, forward and backward. And this is the examination I will show. You can see the ear movement. Then take initially I try to find out the trick movement which can alleviate that. The spectacle which is not produce any improvement. So what do you think the patient is having? This is ear movement, ear movement continuous. No, no, episodically. It's something it is not present all the time. Sometimes it occurs. Then she gets a long followed by cranby pain and then sometimes facial elevation and clenching in the top. The pontine lesion affecting seventh and fifth nerves. Yeah, it could be that because of it, but here that it is spreading in the not only the fifth nerve and also the seventh nerve. Yeah, fifth and seventh. Uh, sir, you did not no, show the tongue. Then? Was it injured? Tongue was injured. Yeah, tongue was, was injured. Yeah, not tongue, cheek, cheek and tongue also. So it's injured because I did the jaw and get injured. That is telling you occurred somebody spinaterally also. Sir, uh, he may get the spasm. It won't affect the facial. It will just yeah. affect the masticatory muscle only. Yeah. He's asking whether it could be hemimasticatory spasm. Yeah, that's correct. It could be hemimasticatory spasm. But the problem is, it is patient not masticatory is. as well. Uh, yeah, patient also is getting it. So, heavy patient masticatory is <laughs> Correct. <laughs> so, as a new entity which you can go and into, that's what you usually do sometimes with cases. There are many cases which are not described in literature, but we have to form our, our own diagnosis. Let us see this patient. Now, let's continue with the story. Now, what she did was to alleviate this severe pain and spasm. She found out that if something is kept between the jaw, the pain and spasm disappears. So she used to put grambu, I don't know, Malayalam grambu, I cannot convert it to English, pepper, not the pepper, uh, the ground thing. So this, she put it between the teeth. Grambu is. Um, clown, clown. Clown, clown. Clown, clown. Clown, Correct, right. Clown, right, exactly. Clown, between the teeth to prevent the jaw from opposing. Because she said that it's a bit more harder, so it will remain for some time. Now you can hear what she's telling. Here, what is happening to the sound? That's what she has done. So she she said little lady. She went to the maxillofacial surgeon and told him to make some gadgets to prevent the jaw from opposing. And since then, she has been putting it in her mouth to alleviate its symptom all the time. Except while eating, when she wants to eat something, she takes out the gadget and eats, again put the gadget back. I'll show you what she's done. This is the gadget with the maxillary question made it for her. She put it inside like that. Then her children, this will not talk. That, that starts appearing. She gets pain now. So this is what she has done. So what is the diagnosis? Is hemimasticatory spasm, hemipatial spasm syndrome? Is it part of a segmental dystonia? I do not know because 
it is uh, there are uh, points for and against usually dystonia will not produce pain hemimasticated spasm will produce pain hemifacial spasm will not produce pain but she has got both together maybe some dystonia so what i presume and another clue is that a favoring so dystonia like a dystonia yeah. because he gets relief because of this uh, thing kept in the yeah, mouth exactly yeah that's a thing that uh, he has got a just a antagonistic phenomenon that some tic stimulation can either alleviate or, or precipitate uh, the spasm he if you put something in between the tongue alleviates the spasm tells is more like a dystonia but the such a severe pain is very very uncommon with any dystonia which i have which i have seen except in some cases of spasmodic torticollis like that so still i feel more like a segmental dystonia producing hemimastic at least spasm and or hemifacial spasm together Did that MRI Mario. show anything, sir? Yeah, normal, normal. Sir, this particular gadget which you showed uh, is used by many people in gym uh, gymnasium, where right? you know all the members, uh, those who are doing very heavy gym, to prevent uh, teeth grinding while doing heavy gym. Okay, 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 okay. Very good. I did not know that. Anyway, yeah, she. Yeah, she actually what she is telling that she went to the doctor said I want you want something to prevent my jaw closing so make it something for me that's what he said she said yeah sir uh, can this be a tic convulsive something like a trigeminal neuralgia going for uh... yeah that tic convulsive pain with facial features but not with the masticatory spasm like that and they don't get relieved by this kind of a tic stimulation. so we can give a botox yes and because sometimes uh, this might be effective in this case yeah. yeah botox can be given definitely can be given but you have to give more than one muscle muscle uh, 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 the the find out the muscle which is producing spasm and get it so just take him if it is the same if it is spasm we give botox no similarly you can give to the muscle which is affected can give or can be given Yeah, yeah, please. So she said that she had left side is affected, but that she was biting the right cheek also, no sir? Like yeah, because yeah, you see, if you want can suppose that middle thyroid is affected or masseter is affected, even on one side, the jaw will close on both sides. See, the muscle contraction on one side can be closed on both sides, but the problem may be more on one side. So depending upon the position that time. At what time it occurs, you can injure it on both sides. Then, even if one muscle contracts, the thumb happens to be on the right side. The right thing also get injured. So you said there were no interesting cases today. Yeah, <laughs> no, I thought that's not nothing but a challenging case is not there. No, these are all a little more straightforward. I mean, no problem in making a real life. Ah, oh, these are a real cases, sir. As Joy told, these are now very, very nice cases. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Mister, this case has been with me for a long time. I was hesitant to present because I don't know there is no real the point to think about it. Then only it makes more interesting, like a Sherlock Holmes approach. Please don't escape me. <laughs> these are all challenging novels for us. <laughs> okay, shall we? Close it now. Yeah, I, I, yeah, Madhu. Uh, hello. Ah, uh, well, go, 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 please, go. Your comments, please. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, no. It's a good case. It's a, actually a spec. You know, in all practice, we have a lot of times this spectrum of this hemi facial pain and huge differential diagnosis, and sometimes there's an overlap. You know, trigeminal neuralgia and uh, hemi masticatory spasm, and so on and so forth. Now, in this context, I want to know what is what is the position of. Uh, this temporomandibular joint arthritis is it a true entity and how to diagnose it and how to treat it do you see this tmg arthritis or yeah, what is yeah. the position of that in fact truly speaking uh, even various headaches specialists are also debating on it whether it's a true entity or not some people okay. call it as functional some people call it as a problem in a migraine variant migraine variant some people call, i don't know What I usually give is they come with pain in the temporomandibular joint. I give us a short course of steroid, ask for exercise. Most of them get relieved. Personally, if you ask me what is the procedure or not, I cannot answer. I myself. 
Yeah, yeah, right, right. I mean, this was a great case because we have to think of all the different cell diagnoses and then sometimes becomes a challenge. Thank you so much. Thank you. So much. Hi, sir. Rupa here. Um, yeah, Rupa, tell me. Uh, sir, uh, how did you treat the last case, sir? This particular case? Yes, sir. Yeah, this particular case, she is happy with that gadget. So she went along with it. She didn't want any other treatment. So she came with, um, for the spasm, I gave carbamazepine. With that, with that, it, be, it was a little better with that. Okay, sir. Thank yeah. Sir. yeah. Nice cases, sir. Yeah. The dystonia part sometimes very difficult to treat. Whatever you give, it will not get control. You try one drug after another, still many of them will. So how, com how common is uh, pain as a manifestation of dystonia? I mean, very, uh, very, very, very rare. I have to say this currently very rare. This journey usually is fast more torticollis can produce severe pain. And sometimes okay. writer's camp can produce sometimes severe pain. Other dystonians usually are not painful. Hmm. Yeah. Sir, uh, sir, yeah, sir skull base was more normal, case. sir, in this case. Pardon? The skull base, where the mandibular nerve comes down and the but, facial nerve comes no, down. No, I didn't specifically that, for that. No, because it's very unlikely, you know, this, because both nerves are... Uh, Coming through different foramina, that is one is fifth nerve, the other is uh, going to the CPN region. So, skull base, I did not specifically look for the MRI brain was normal. Okay. Sir, uh, uh, some of the cases uh, I have given botox to the trigeminal neuro neuralgia, mm -hmm. the, uh, 20 to 20 percent, most of them improved very well, sir. Yeah, the, the, what, see, any overaction of the muscle can be alleviated by botox. That's very, very non-specific treatment. No? You give him any contract, over contraction, get it relieved. But the problem with Botox is that uh, after some time get habituated, the duration will come down, the cost, everything is it matters. Those who can afford, you can definitely give. Okay, sir. Now, I'll tell you very frankly about giving for Botox. How many persons of your persons who had been receiving Botox Pursued with taking Botox. See, we are seeing it for 20 years. How many of them continue to take Botox every three or six months time? Ultimately. Not, uh, not uh, every three, sir. Maybe every eight months or even a year. Rarely, rarely only. Rarely only. Rarely only last for six months. But even after six months or eight months, they most of them take two, two, three times, two or three times. <laughs> Yeah, tell me, Joy. In Canada, Joy, you you take, take uh, in Canada, Botox is free, so they used to come regularly. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, yeah correct. But here, Botox is I seen many people with dystonia come to me. Most of them are taken to Botox from various places. Then ultimately, they stop taking Botox and come. They say do something for that, probably because the affordability, or then sometimes most of them get the. The Botox is not going to produce efficacy after some time. It stops, stop, uh, stops its efficacy. That's true. That's true. Uh, that's why the problem people get come to you. Sir, uh, recently I had a patient who underwent microvascular decompression. Mm. And uh, that's done uh, 12 years ago. Mm. Now he has got severe pain and spasm, just like the last page patient. Mm. So actually he was taking many medications and uh, he was done Botox once from outside. From, different uh, person. So actually after uh, microvascular decompression for trigeminal neuralgia. So have you? So, yeah. Those cases actually we should go for water as you said correctly. Okay. So, so we can have one more case. Sir. Okay. okay so, this is a long case. I think I keep that case and put the short case. Give a short case, okay? Yes, sir. Okay, this is not a short case, still, I can, can be considered as a short case. No, no so, sorry. Yeah, this is the patient. He's a 64 year old man. Old case of polio appeared in the right lower limb. Presently is admitted with history of relatively subacute onset of imbalance while walking for the last three months. The unsteadiness worsened during the next two weeks, needing support of two persons to walk. 
at the peak of the deficit, he had dysarthria. So three months imbalance, the date not developing dysarthria. He was admitted to local hospital and treated with that treated. The text partially improved. So much so you could walk without support. For the last two weeks, Vipesh was noticed to be excessively angry with apprehension and loss of sleep. This is the patient. He has got Power to normal. The volume power is normal, reflex is normal. Pandas were down going. Get Hilshi in coordination was present. Look at the gate is unsteady. In the He walks with broad base, broad weight attacks the gate. And old polyamylated right leg, that means that it puts a saxon on that. It's got a mild foot drop on the right side as well. So, next time we share staccato speech, that's why I could not show the speech to you. The rest of the candles are normal, no nystagmus, motor tone power normal, it is all normal except the right and knee and angle check, sensation is normal, bilateral limb and gait attacks here. So, what do you think is uh, probably two, uh, two months is three with, uh, two, uh, with progression over two weeks? Recently, he's got some behavioral changes. Hydrocephalus, sir. Hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus. The upper limb in coordination will not occur with hydrocephalus. Yeah, it could be bilateral neocerebral moment or subacute onset. So, what possibilities will you keep in mind? Perineoplastic. Okay, perineoplastic is a possibility. Good. So, so let us see the investigation. You want MRI, no? Before that, yeah. ah, MRI, normal. So when you have subacute cerebellar attacks here without any uh, mass lesion in the brains and the MRI, two most common possibilities we want is perineoplastic, subacute, secondary subacute, proto-immune condition, and encephalopathies like anti GAD involvement or um, antithyroid antibodies. Those things you have to keep in, or paramilitary para solid rule. These are the things you have to keep in, and, and celiac disease, this you have to keep in mind. Apart from toxic conditions, well, of course, that you'll get from the history. Pardon? Yeah, okay. Sorry. So, there is a uh, tell me, Bindu. Yeah, is he a diabetic, sir? Not a diabetic, not a diabetic. 
So it was AG was negative, vitro was negative, and uh, vitamin B12 was normal. CSO was done, we should one cell, protein 40, glucose 166. So what do you want to know? Perioplastic profile was negative. Anti-TPO, sir? Correct. Theroglobin antibody was 185. High, anti-TPO is also very high. This is autoimmune thyroiditis. So, on, uh, so uh, to call this autoimmune thyroid, this value has to be taken value to degrees. Otherwise, it has no significance. But correlating with the clinical context, I'm thinking because the cerebellar signs, cerebellar attacks one percentage of uh, Hashimoto's involvement. And especially, it's got some behavioral change occurring recently. Again, telling you that the lesion is not confined to the cerebellum. So, patient was followed up. This is the patient. You just saw the speech initially. It was daily stuck at His gait has remarkably improved. So that's the story. She was given corticosteroid. With that, improved remarkably. It's the most likely an autoimmune thyroiditis producing cellular attacks and behavioral change. Both the complaint improved. What was the clue uh, here? No, 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 only subacute attacks here. We worked up like that. We sent for anti GAD antibody and this thing, celiac disease and this thing. TPO came as possible. I initially sent TPO, subsequently, as I'm planning to do the other test because the test is costly. Okay. GAD antibody and other things are very costly. So I thought I will initially do thyroid antibody. If it is negative, I'll go for the other antibodies. Yeah. So many times we get falsely yeah. elevated anti TPO antibody. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. So if you get an elevated antibody, that alone does not mean anything unless you get a subsequent value showing an increasing title. So it could not be falsely elevated. It could be yeah. really elevated and uh, not be, many of them may not be having symptoms. Correct, exactly. So unless you find a progressive elevation. So here we thought it is related because only because it's symptomatic. We couldn't find any explanation for its cellular attacks here. So being a treatable condition, I thought we'll treat it anyway. So I presume, I cannot be 100% certain, more likely so, since there was no demyelinating lesion or any any other evidence such as subacute cellular attacks. We recently had two patients, one with antithyroid antibody positive responded to steroids and another patient with uh, GAD positive, but she's not responding well to the steroids. GAD positive cellular attacks, they will not respond. They don't respond very much to steroids. They give out a little more, I mean, other immunosuppressive agent has to be given. GAD is less responsive. Sir, do we have to check for the uh, testicular malignancy for uh, ataxia in, in this case? In fact, you can you can do a band in Mormon and you buy and it and the uh, and your barrier of antibody can be sent and then ideally you can do a PET scan and there are a lot of investigations which can be done. If the, the all depends upon the affordability. See, the, any suppose today, recently I have a patient in my ward with cerebellar attacks. We, we couldn't make a diagnosis of what it is. We wanted to pet CT, but they're all fumbling with whether to send such a costly investigation straight away. And the patient has to spell, I mean, spend money from his pocket. That's a problem. Ideally, yes, which patient I have a, the whole body pet. If you cannot do that, you have to go for the CT abdomen, CT chest, ultrasound thyroid, as well as testicular ultrasound thyroid, testicular, all to quiet. But how far to invest in a particular person is uh, deserved by many factors other than the, the, uh, the, call the scientific um, approach. Even pets' cost has come down, sir. I think it's only 18,000 yeah. now compared to some of the blood tests. Right. Pet costs only, I think, 18,000 now. Okay, very good. Then we'll try that. How, how long we give steroids? No, this only gave one course. I will be for five days and the short course is steroid. Two weeks later, we make them all right. Now the term is sweet. That's sweet. Pardon? Sweet. That's steroid response here and nobody associated with autoimmune thyroid. Sweet. 
ിസ്റ്റിസ്റ്റിസ്റ്റിസ്റ്റിസ്റ്റിസ്റ്റിസ്റ്റിസ്റ്റിസ്റ്റിസ്റ്റിസ്റ്റിസ്റ്റിസ